she's going to have her own introduction, so I'm just going to leave it to Angela Rowe. All right, folks, so we are going to get started. All right, so welcome back. We are going to kick off by, um, first we're going to start by learning this sort of design thinking practice. Um, so from here forward, a lot of what we're going to be talking about is how to create a good design for our apiary. So whether you are just starting out or you are thinking about expanding or based on what we've talked about today, you are going to be raising your own queens moving forward. Um, or you want to try that out, or you want to go from Miller method to grafting. Whatever it is, um, you are going to be using sort of some, what's called design thinking to think through how we're going to do that. So what do I mean when I say that? Um, design thinking is, is thinking about your problem and then trying to generate a series of solutions to your problem, and then based on those solutions, picking the best solution that makes sense for you. A lot of how designers work together is that they wor or work is that they work together, um, typically in pairs or in teams, and they do a lot of listening to each other. Okay, so when they are listening to each other, they're listening to people's ideas um, and they're listening to um, solutions, and they're trying to think about the things that the person who's complaining about a problem um, is saying, but maybe not registering in their mind, so they can come up with the best solutions to the problem. Why am I telling you all of this? Um, so I think that a really a, an important practice if we are going to move towards working in more cooperative apiaries is that we learn to listen to each other. I love beekeepers, but a lot of what we do is just talk at each other. <laughs> and we don't spend a lot of time really genuinely listening to each other. Um, so as part of this practice, uh, and, and I actually will not, I will not say that that's just beekeepers, but that is actually like human beings in general. We're actually pretty crummy at listening to each other. So um, this practice, the, the first part of this practice is to get us comfortable with listening to each other. It's going to be timed. We're going to move through the stages of it fairly quickly. Um, and we're going to first do an interview. Uh, so you have a packet. Somewhere I have a copy of the packet. May I see this? Thanks. So you have this little packet, and I'm just going to walk you through the steps of it. So the first step that we're going to do, oh gracious, good job, is this page right here. We want to get to this page here. So it's got uh, the words interview. Thanks. <laughs> Good golly. Um, OK, so we're going to work from this page. And basically what we're going to do is, um, is what's called deep listening. So I'm going to set a timer. You're going to have four minutes, OK? Only one person, you're going you're to break into teams of two people. Those two people are going to practice listening and speaking, OK? So for four minutes, you can talk about where your apiary is at, what you're trying to accomplish. And the other person is going to do one thing. They are only going to do one thing, and that is going to listen, OK? They're not going to interject. They're not going to say anything. You're going to be quiet. You're going to give that other person your undivided attention. You're going to smile at them like you're smiling at me. You're going to show them that you're listening to them. You can nod your head. Um, but you're not going to interject with your own ideas or opinions yet, OK? You're just going to listen. Um, as you're listening, if you want to take some notes, you can do that. That's what these little boxes are for. And so with one person, you are just going to spend four minutes listening. And as the other person, you're going to spend that four minutes talking. If you go three minutes and run out of things to say, start talking about something else. I don't care. But do not let that other person start talking until your four minutes is up. Okay? Um, and the reason that we're doing this in a structured way is just to get used to the listening um, and the talking. As human beings in this modern capitalist society, we don't spend enough time being what's called witness, so having people listen to us authentically, and we don't spend enough time authentically listening to other people. And then we have all of these sort of like uh, silos of problems, and we're not thinking about where there could be potential for solutions if we worked across those silos. So in holding that in our minds, we are going to try this practice. I get that this might be outside of our range of comfort, but I'm asking you for the sake of learning to push yourself a little bit and to try this out. 
So first thing we're going to do is I'm going to set a timer for four minutes. Once we split into pairs, four minutes of listening, four minutes of talking, um, and I will call the time as the time comes up. Okay, so when I call four minutes, we'll take like a 10 second pause so we can get readapted and we'll switch. And then I'll give you the instructions for the next section. So get my trusty timer. Why don't you find a partner that you can work with comfortably? <laughs> All right, does everybody have a partner? Everyone have a partner. Can you raise your hand if you do not have a partner? You just need one partner. Yeah, I can also I can also work with you. Let's do that. Okay, everybody's got a partner. You know that person's name? Oh wait, there's a threesome on the on the back table. Go jump in on that. Okay, so you just want one partner. You should not have a three uh, a tripod. You should just have one other partner. Okay. For f one of you is going to speak now, and we're going to speak for four minutes. And what you're talking about? Hold on. What you're talking about is where your apiary is at now, and where you would like it to be. Okay. How many hives you have? What your practices are? Just where you're at now, and what your sort of projected ideal goal is for yourself. Okay. So where are you now? Where do you want to be? Ready? Don't forget to smile at each other. Go. attention and still that we're talking we're using those same talking points where are you at now where do you want to be ready go So you have a shorter time frame. I'm going to give you two minutes and 30 seconds. And in that two minutes and 30 seconds, you are going to ask questions, right? So you just spend some time listening to that person. You heard what they had to say, what they want, what their challenges are. Ask them some questions. Why do you want what you want? What's the point of that? What would be the most ideal objective for you? I try to keep the questions open-ended so that it's not just yes, no, yes, no. But dig into some of the things that you heard them saying to you, and maybe you took some notes, or maybe something really struck you about it, and listen to what they have to say, OK? Mm -hmm. So two minutes and 30 seconds, you're going to dig deeper into that person's problems, um, and not necessarily make suggestions, but just asking clarifying um, deeper questions. We ready? All right, here we go. Okay, find a stopping point there. Okay, we are going to switch one more time. So now the person that did not get a chance to ask more probing questions, you're going to take that on, and then the other person is going to have an opportunity to respond. Okay? So two minutes and 30 seconds, you're going to let, you're going to ask questions. So whomever did not get the opportunity to do that, make those changes. We're all clear? Okay, go ahead. 
Double-sided always makes me so wonky, and I don't understand. Uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, so at this stage in capturing findings, um, what you're going to write under goals and wishes, what your partner is trying to achieve through beekeeping. I know this says gift giving. We're using a framework from a design class, so that's why it says this. But what we are saying is, what is our partner trying to achieve through beekeeping? And then. In a tiny, tiny little asterisk underneath that, it says use verbs, so action words, right? What's your partner trying to achieve? What are the actions that they're trying to get at? And we're going to take three minutes to answer this question and then the next question, which is um, what are some new learnings about your partner's motivation and experience? Um, what's something that you see in your partner's experience that maybe they don't notice, okay? So you're going to take three minutes, one minute and 30 seconds, to write about each of these questions. Um, so what is your partner trying to achieve through beekeeping? Um, and what are you learning about your partner's feelings or motivations or about what their experience is that maybe they're not aware of? We're the Yankees up there. What are their feelings? I know. I know. It's radical. I'm changing, changing the world one beekeeper at a time over here. What? <laughs> Okay, so three minutes, so just take some time, write on that. If you need some more room, you can write in the columns, you can write above that or below that. Great, so finish up that last thought, whatever you're writing down. We're going to move on um, to step four. So this is where you're going to take a standpoint. And we are basically, we're working through this workbook, thinking about someone else. And then the next exercise, we're going to be thinking about ourselves. Um, so just continue holding that other person in your mind. So in this first um, little section, you are going to write your partner's name or a description of them. Probably their name is a safe bet, so you don't write something weird and funny. <laughs> um, and then you're going to write what their user need is. What do I mean by that? I mean. What are they trying to accomplish? So you spent this time listening to them. You spent them at this time asking them these clarifying questions. So you're going to say, Ed needs a way to um, treat his bees, right? Because we were making fun of him earlier. So, um, and why? Okay, because or but? What is your insight about what your partner said to you and why they are trying to accomplish this? So Ed needs a good system of management for treating his bees because he is finding a lot of crystallized mite poop in his bee um, hives at the end of winter. Okay, So take about two minutes for this section and just write down what your partner's user need is. And maybe there's more than one because we've been talking about what we're trying to achieve in our apiary. So it's fine for you to say, oh, Ed needs the way to treat his bees. Well, he also... If he's treating, he needs a way to count his mites, right? So maybe we have a recommendation for the best solution for counting mites. Um, if your partner is looking for a way to raise new queens, um, then they also need some kind of system of management. So think about all the, the challenges that they're going to come up with, will come up against when they're trying to solve this problem. So we'll take about two minutes of writing for that. Is there to be a challenge? What do you mean? Is it challenge they're up against? Mm-hmm. Does that have to be a challenge? No. Okay. Could be what would 
what's an example of not a challenge? It's a benefit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, you're sort of trying to design it from a more positive spin. Exactly. Yeah, go for it. Positive spin. Mm-hmm. Right, so we're just finishing up our final thought here for the um, user challenge or what your user is facing. And then we're going to move on to um, the page that has the number five at the top. Okay? You don't have to draw. You can write in the boxes. Um, but figure out five ways that you would recommend that your partner solve the problem of their apiary or that they change their practices um, based on what you listen to them say. And you're going to write or draw the five ways in these five boxes. Okay? If it's helpful for you, what you can do is from the previous page where four was. You can take this, um, taking a stand or a viewpoint, and you can switch it into box five so you can keep track of what's called the statement of problem. But you don't have to do that if you don't want to. All right, and we're going to take about five minutes. So you're getting one minute for each solution here. <laughs> and again, this is not, you're not coming up, you're not trying to figure out five problems, you're figuring out five solutions to maybe one problem or one issue that's happening in the apiary. Okay, we are going to pause there um, and we are going to finish up with number six. So what you're going to do here um, is you're going to go back to your partner and you're going to tell them what solutions to their problem you designed. Okay, so you're gonna get you're gonna get three minutes to talk to them, and they're going to listen to you, and they can say things like "thank you." But as the person who's listening to someone else recommend solutions, don't be like "no" or "I'm not doing that." <laughs> um, so take your three minutes. If you are the person speaking, you're talking about the, the solutions, and as the person receiving solutions, remember, you don't have to use any of these, but just be nice and listen, and you might find something that's useful to you, and if, if not, that's okay, and you can leave it on the floor. All right? Here we go. Okay, so finish up your last thought and we are going to trade places. So you're going to have uh, three minutes to swap, okay? So now whoever did not get a chance to share their new ideas will have that opportunity. Ready, go. Okay, folks, find a natural stopping point for me, please. Okay, so. No, once we get rolling on this, like, witnessing each other's problems and solutions, it's exciting. I know it's a little hard to get into at first, but it's cool. Um, so typically, we would also go into, like, the next iteration, which looks like you would take the ideas and try to really flesh them out. But for the sake of time, we're not going to do that. What I'd like to do um, instead, how, actually first, however, if you feel like you design something and you want to get deeper into it, there's another page here that you can use while we're working um, later on when we're doing our own apiary design. So feel free to use that if someone gave you a good idea and you want to flesh it out a little bit more. And feel free to also go back to that person and talk to them about their idea so you can do that. But what I want to do right now is I want to just hear from you some of the problems that we came up against and maybe a couple of um, the solutions that you came up with to those problems. You want us to tell you? Yeah. Oh. 
Well, I'll start because I don't even have privacy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that an easy well. problem yeah, to fix. <laughs> talked about mites and I'm sufficiently freaked out by the whole mite thing. I will never say I don't have mites in my life <laughs> because we all have mites. But um, I think that it would be wise for us to just go into uh, the beekeeping with the thought of treating three times a year no matter what. I mean, I, that's what I'm coming up with. Um, like maybe treating like shortly after we get them. I mean, looking also using management techniques to see whether or not there are mites, but alcohol watch, the sticky paper on the back, bottom. But be more proactive is what I'm saying. And it could be up to treating three times a year, but be very careful because the best time to treat would be in the fall before the winter. And um, he's also worried about swarming. And I learned about something about that too. And also the pesticides <clears throat> in our neighborhood. <clears throat> Even though we don't use anything in heaven for years, all of our neighbors have the habit of just over-treating for all sorts mm. of stuff. And we have to keep good relations with them, and um, John came up with some good ideas about how to handle that, which was fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. So the only interjection I'm going to make here is do not treat your bees unnecessarily. Do not just blanket treat your bees three times a year, because uh. what you are then going to be doing is making your mites more resistant to mite treatments. Oh. You only treat your bees if absolutely necessary. If you have a high mite count, you treat your bees. If you're blanket treating your bees, you're basically making stronger mites. Oh, so they I become more resistant if they're getting those um, applications. And that's why we're getting deeper and deeper into this. We started with these formic acid, and then we had the thymol mm -hmm. acid, and now we have the oxalic acid, and pretty soon we're going to run out of acids to put on our these exoskeletons. So um, we really need to be conscious, and that's why, and, and I think it'll be great to go to Ed's talk and hear <laughs> about mite management. I didn't get deep into it here because I knew that you guys had that coming up, but um, the, the reason that it's important to do those counts is to know, do I have to treat, do I not have to treat? And if you don't have to treat, don't treat. I think in your plan, you can put in your plan, okay, if I have to treat, I'm going to treat on this date, this date, and this date. And I'm going to count my mites before those dates so I can apply those treatments. But I don't think that you should just treat in a blanket way because it's just like if you applied pesticides to your yard in a blanket way, right? Well, I think there's going to be downy mildew, so I'm just going to put this pesticide on in case there is downy mildew. Doesn't It, it just means that you're using a pesticide more than you have to be. Does that make sense? Yeah, because cool. I was really bugged out when I heard about the mites. I didn't realize we were going to have to do that. The beekeeping, that was what we learned the first day of mm -hmm. school. And so now, we, and we don't really use, I don't know, if you're right, I would have probably done it too much. I, I'm, now I'm even more confused, but I'll figure it out. We'll need to go, what day is that? My day. Wednesday, Wednesday night. <laughs> oh, okay. Right here. My day. My night. My night. My night. Oh. But I also learned that if you can't attend Ed's presentation, that it's going to be on uh, the internet. What is your station again, please? FCATV.org. FCATV.org? Yep. Great. So it'll be on there so you'll be able to access um, the Mite Talk. Um, and also, I would recommend when I, I'll send these slides out to Ed and then you can disseminate to the club. But um, I would recommend going through and watching the different ways that the, mite, the treatments are, or the counts are done. Because they, again, talk about the importance of not treating unless you have to treat. And they'll explain um, in more detail why. Um, so again, it's knowing what's going on so you can respond to it and not just reacting by saying, I'm going to do this because I think I have to. Right? Um, it's, it's systemic management. That's what we're talking about, is really being able to respond to an, an entire system. Other problems and solutions we designed for them? I think what you just said about the, the overall management is kind of what all the things that I came up with for Ed boil down to, that, that being more observant, being more mindful of what's going on and really mm -hmm. watching how much nectar and how much pollen is coming in right now. If there's not enough, feed them. How much, you know, what are your mite counts? Just being more interactive with the bees and more really watching for what's mm -hmm. really very 
closely is happening in those yeah. highs as yeah. opposed to maybe being able to not ignore them but but let them do their own thing for longer periods of time that maybe nowadays we need to be more mindful and more observant than yeah. we have been. Yeah, totally. That's such a good encapsulation. Could you go out and just tell that to everyone <laughs> in the whole world? <laughs> Yeah, so it's really about this mindfulness, right? And we're, you know, some of what I've designed for us to work with today, especially with respect to witnessing and talking about nested systems, a lot of this stuff is drawn from like permaculture design, right? So permaculture design is this idea that you're taking an entire ecosystem and designing it so that it feeds off of itself. So it's a self-sustaining ecosystem. And in order to do that, you have to be mindful of the plants you put into it. You have to be mindful of their interactions with each other. You have to be mindful of what's happening inside of that system at all points during the year. Um, and that system's gonna look really different in Georgia than it does in New England, and that's gonna look different than it does in the Midwest. Um, so what, what I really am trying to push is this idea of mindful beekeeping, that we don't have the luxury any longer of just following somebody else's calendar or doing what somebody else tells us to do. We get to think for ourselves. And I think that that is hard when you're learning a thing because you just want someone to tell you how to do it so you can go out and do it the way that they said that you should do it. But the way that my calendar works is gonna look really different in Montague, Massachusetts than it's gonna look for you in Norfolk County because y'all are a few weeks ahead of me with respect to, um, to, to nectar, right, or, or rather pollen right now. And then in the fall, my, my flows are gonna be coming on later when your flows have already ended. So it's, it's really about this mindfulness that we have to take this in and really be mindfully acting with our bees um, and thinking about them as a nested system within an ecosystem um, that I'm trying to get you to take away here. And that's why we want to do this witnessing. We want to think about some of the problems that we have, what the solutions to those problems are, um, and we want to get some outside perspectives, right? Like, so not only do I um, think by myself, but I also have mentors and I also have friends. And I also think it's important for us to learn to listen to each other because maybe a new beekeeper has an idea that you haven't thought of as somebody who's been beekeeping for 10 years. And I'm not saying they're gonna tell you a radical new way to rear queens, but maybe they have an idea about what types of plants to plant because they've been uh, gardening <coughs> for 15 years. So there's these ways that we can build off of each other's expertise um, that can be really powerful and sort of like start to de-structure this like hierarchy of thinking where like I stand up here and tell you what you should do. That's not what I'm about. I want you to think about what you should do and then act accordingly because I can't be holding your hand throughout the whole entire season telling you and now is when we treat for mites and now is when we put our sticky boards in and now is when we wrap our hives. We all have these tiny microclimates that we're acting with, especially in New England, um, that we have to be able to respond to. Other problems and rad solutions we came up with? I saw some cool like designing of actual ideas going on at this table. Did you? So we were talking about hive stands and, uh -huh. and how uh, people uh, do different things, whether it be cinder blocks and, and whatever. And, and uh, you know, what is the ideal height and so on. And, and, and we talked about, you know, the ideal height is what you can work with, mm -hmm. uh, depending on, on your physical height. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, I have, through many designs, found one that works for me, and, and uh, it's sturdy, and, and I can have six uh, uh, honey supers on top uh, of the hive, and, and it's still sturdy enough, and it's small footprint, but it gets it off the ground. So it was just, you know, whether we use pallets or cinder blocks or whatever, uh, uh, it just needs to be sturdy and you be able to work it. Cool. Um, and keep the skunk away and the mice out mm -hmm. and so on. So. I have the biggest possum I've ever seen in my life living underneath one of my hive stands right now. It's really, I mean, she can't get in the yard, but she is like, she's like the size of a small dog. It's amazing. <laughs> Are they bothered? I think they will eat them if What's they that? can. Possums? Possums she's, she's not eating the bees. She's eating all the old rotten <coughs> apples from my orchard. So she's probably like drunk all the time. But <laughs> <laughs> she's also a t yeah, she's a tick magnet. I have not had a single tick on me since she's been living under there, so she can stay as long as she likes. 
Cool. Okay, so we are going to shift into um, doing a little bit more of our own planning, um, and maybe we can just take like a like a five minute water bio bathroom break while I get this queued up and then come back together. So if we could just be back here at 2.17, that would be great. Is that your property? This, no, this is actually up at, um, <laughs> this is up at Kirk's. This is what I was saying is it's like a totally different landscape than I've ever seen in Yeah, yeah. And there's all this um, like old German architecture. Yeah, yeah. get into this and then have some time for this because otherwise we're going to run out. Folks on tape, see the Yeah, 
Skeletons. Okay, folks, let's come back together, please. 